So I just want to give you a quick background on, on my history. I worked in the National Park Service at Sandy Hook from 1992 to 2009. Um, Sandy Hook is a barrier island jutting into New York Harbor and its history is both maritime and military. Uh, lighthouse is the oldest lighthouse in the country and you know about two and a half million visitors go there to see the beaches every year. I, it was started out as a, with the military functions in the 1890s with uh, this gun battery, this is Battery Potter, where it was the first time they had disappearing guns, which meant the guns came up, fired out into the ocean, and then hid behind concrete and earth and sand. The last form of defense out at Sandy Hook is uh, the Nike missiles, which were there from 1954 to 1974. I was a museum curator from 2000 and 2000 to 2009, and in that role, I was taking care of 30,000 objects, everything from artillery shells to seashells to uniforms to buttons, and that's um, I, I got very involved in researching the Women's Army Corps. Um, in 2000, we opened up 2001. We opened up the museum collection for the first time so that the public could see the public's collection. It does belong to the American people, and uh, we opened it up and people could see what we had in our collection. And another big thing that I did was an oral history program with Monmouth University. And uh, if you are interested in the 80 interviews that were recorded and transcribed, they are available on the Parks website. And my business that I have is called Beacon Point History Services, and I do a lot of these online lectures, which everyone's welcome to join. If you check out my Facebook page, I post the link beforehand. I can just show a quick video about uh, the women in the military before um, we start the slideshow. utilized, we are still short millions of hands. We must call upon women. All over the United States, women are called upon to leave their homes and take jobs. Among our young unmarried women and among older women whose children are grown, we have a large reserve. They discover that factory work is usually no more difficult than housework. Employers find that women can do many jobs as well as men. Some jobs better. Tens of thousands of women are already at work in aircraft. More are being added as fast as they apply. This solves the breadwinning problem for many families whose men are at war. The government's policy is that women should get the same pay that men get for similar work. Where necessary, machinery is adapted for women's use. When a hand drill weighs heavily on feminine muscles, the lazy arm drill is introduced to take off the strain. When married women with small children have to take jobs, everything possible will be done to provide day care for the children. Yeah, I just wanted to start that before everything because I, I just find that a fascinating insight into what was going on at the time period. So I call this the skirt and stocking clad soldier because this was the first time military women were actually going to be in the military. So prior to this, there was an army nurse corps and there was a Navy nurse corps, but those women who served were not in the army and they were not in the Navy. So uh, they were given a relative rank in like not until 1920 and it wasn't until after World War II that they were given the full pay and benefits that uh, the soldiers were given. So they were serving in it was sort of like a limbo. Uh, most women were they were all officers, but they really weren't given the same benefits as the men until post World War II. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Melissa Ziobro, who works at Monmouth University, does a, does a program at the Hello Girls, and this was the U.S. Army Signal Corps sent 
these women to Europe during World War I that were fluent in, in French and English and they gave, uh, they took over for the men and were much more efficient in switchboard operation. Um, the calls were going through at much rapid speed than when, when the soldiers who were men were taking care of it. They dressed in uniforms, but they were not given any military benefits. They thought they were in the military, but they said, oh no, no, they are not, they're definitely not. So this is World War I. So we pop up to World War II and we had nurses serving overseas in war zones. There were 59,000 women in the Army Nurse Corps and 14,000 in the Army Navy Corps. And uh, there were, women were taking POWs in the Philippines, which is, uh, if you've never seen the movie, so probably we hail, uh, goes along and explains the whole situation where they were taken captive. They were still doing their duties and taking care of the soldiers in the Philippines, but they were, they were prisoners of war at the time. So 32,000 of those women in the Army Nurse Corps did serve overseas. Stateside, um, so after I left the Park Service, we moved to, uh, my husband has a job at Aberdeen Proving Ground. So I got a little bit more involved and learned about the history of the Proving Ground. But we got some photographs. Um, women stateside were trained. They were taking care of soldiers at home, but they were being trained to potentially go overseas. You could see they were getting instruction on how to use a gas mask. And then the bottom photograph is from Fort Hancock of the, the nurses and the, and the doctors who were serving at Fort Hancock. So what had to happen is we had a military that needed extra bodies. We needed to have women serving in non-combat roles so that the men could be freed for service, which brought some resentment as well. But you know, General George Marshall said there are innumerable duties now being performed by soldiers that can actually be better done by women. So the bill went through Congress and it was finally passed May 15th, 1942, but it only was able to pass as an auxiliary corps. They were not, the women who joined were not given the same ranks and privileges as the men. It was a separate corps, it had its own insignia, but the, the and this is before the other military services got involved, they were, the wax were the only ones who were gonna be able to go overseas. So that was a big recruitment bonus for them. The first director um, was a highly capable woman who came as a publisher from the Houston Post and she later became the first secretary of health, education and welfare. Um, and she, she ran the service throughout the war. So she made a great statement. You have made change from peacetime pursuits to wartime tasks from individually to the anonymity of mass military life. You've given up comfortable homes, highly paid positions and you've taken off silk and put on khaki because you have a date, a debt and a date. So it was, it, it was uh, her first graduating class was out at Fort Des Moines, Iowa. That was where the main contingent of WACs were first trained. So 13,000 women applied for 450 officers slots. Most of these women had master's degrees. Um, so a lot of them ended up becoming enlisted. They were much higher educated than the men. They had to have completed high school. Uh, men did not have to have completed high school. They had to be 21 and they had to be good health and character. They had a certain size restriction um, between five and six feet tall. Uh, Julia Childs tried to join the WAC, but she was over six feet tall. So she was rejected. Um, and they had to be between 105 and 200 pounds. So the Women's Army Corps finally was changed to full status September of 1943. And at this point in time, they were regular members of the military. They were privates, they were corporals, they were sergeants. Before that, they were called leader and assistant leader or recruit. They, they had different designations and, and everything. So the service had 99,000 women at its peak serving at the same time um, by its wars and 149,000 women had worn the army uniform, which were ill-fitting. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't get a designer like the Navy did later on. So we have some interesting things. It talks about um, the military came out and explained what the difference was between the, the auxiliaries and the present. 
So the auxiliaries didn't have to match certain physical standards. Um, so some of them were let go. You were given the option to leave if you didn't want to be a full member of the military. So they had to make that decision. Um, this is at Fort Hancock. This is in front of their barracks. And that is in September 1943 when the women of the auxiliary became the women of the Women's Army Corps, full members. And you can see in the image, the other things that were sort of interesting is that all women's hem lines had to be 16 inches from the ground. So they all matched when they were marching. They were all ill-fitting. They just hadn't, they didn't have a, a fashion designer take their care of their uniform the way that the Navy saw the mistakes of the Army and took care of that. So the waves, people made fun of the acronym WAX. So the, the Navy said, well, we're going to make an acronym that people like before we decide what it says. So they made the this expression, the waves, and it became women accepted for volunteer emergency services. So this bill was only a few months later than the bill for the wax, but right away they were the same ranks and privileges as the men. And Mildred Horton became the director. She also decided to not choose military bases to train. She chose women's colleges. So Hunter College and Mount Holyoke were some of the um, the main places where they train them. So as director of the WAVES, she was from a women's college, Wellesley, and she chose all these women's colleges to train them. And, and she basically saw the mistakes of the WAC and changed it. Uniforms were designed by designers, made them look a little bit better. Uh, and they're just a little bit, uh, one of the women who went to Hunter College Training Center and she said she didn't do anything heroic. Everybody came from across the country and they were thrilled to be in the Navy. The Marines are part of the Navy, so they were even a smaller force. There were only 18,000 that served total. And they, because they were part of the Navy, they came in on the same day that the Navy did. And they didn't go for a cute acronym, they just called them Women Marines. Um, and they went to Camp Lejeune and they observed combat training. So they were, you know, they were Marines. And you can see there's a Marine marching band. And the smallest of all the surfaces was the Coast Guard and Coast Guard in time of war is part of the Department of Defense. They were not created until November of 42. And they went with the, the Latin phrase, Semper Petraeus, always ready. So they became known as the SPARs. The one service that I really like to talk about, the, the WASPs, there were over a thousand of them. These were trained pilots. They had to be trained as pilots prior to, um, prior to the war. And so there weren't that many of them. I mean, it was a thousand as compared to the other services. And they, what's unfortunate about the whole situation with the wasps is that they were flying planes and 38 women died in plane crashes they a lot of these women flew planes that the men refused to fly because they were experimental they uh weren't weren't well tested the women were flying these and the 38 women who lost their lives when they died their families had to pay for their burial during the transport back home they, they weren't given military status until finally in 1977 and um, with their with the the ranks and pay. So, you know, if a WAC died in service, the military paid for them to be returned. The WASPs did not have that privilege and they were in a much more dangerous profession. So what types of work did they have? They were doing clerical work. They were working in the motor pool. They were testing weapons. They were photographers. They were mathematicians. Um, of course, everything comes and goes. So the men did gripe a bit about having these women in the service because they were getting 
because it was a brand new service and it was so tiny, they were getting promoted. So you can see the article in the Sandy Hook Foghorn, 21 wax received stripes. Um, so they got, there were a whole bunch of sergeants and that didn't exist in the, the guys were privates for many, many years. So column left was kind of where they could complain. Um, so you can see that in the article, they're talking about the wax got all these carloads of upholstery and insignia so they could be promoted, but the dog faces, the men were like forever privates. So they were a little bit insulted by that. And uh, in the Women's Army Corps, there were 6,500 African-American wax. And that was, when they started the Women's Army Corps, it was a, given a 10% quota. So uh, they didn't quite reach the 10%, but there were 6,500 African-Americans served. And one of the units that became somewhat famous was in 1944, 855 of these women went to Europe. Uh, they were the only African-Americans that were sent over to Europe as part of the Women's Army Corps and they handled the mail. And it, did, it took them a while to get the recognition they deserved, it was many years later, but they, the mail system in Europe was terrible as far as the military was concerned and they came in and they, they straightened it all out. Another of the, um, African-American stories was at Fort Des Moines, which is where they were all being trained. It was the only uh, all black female band in US military history. It was a 404th Army Service Forces Band. These women uh, formed the, the white band wouldn't allow them in. So they formed their own band. Most of them did not know how to play instruments. The local university, they were taking lessons. And then some of the women in the, the regular band were offering them lessons and they served throughout the Midwest, including Fort Des Moines, but they would also do a lot of um, bomb drives. They would go to Chicago often and, and play for them there. There were, in addition to that, there were, it wasn't until October 1944 that the waves um, allowed, Roosevelt allowed some um, African-American women to join. So there were two officers joined in 1944. By the end of the war, there were only seven, 70 women that were African-American who joined. And then another whole aspect that were not in the military, the Rosie the Riveters. These women served in aircraft factories, as we saw in the video. They served on the shipyards. They served anywhere that they were needed to support the war effort. And um, you can see they were joined in the union as they would have, but another movie, if you're interested in the Women's Army Corps and the, the women at the time, it's a comedy as I was a male, <laughs> I was a male war bride, uh, Cary Grant and Ann Sheridan, and she's in the Women's Army Corps. He was in the French military and, and uh, they get married and then he has to come back to the US and they, didn't they really they had a lot of women war brides, but that was a, that was a big issue. So if you want to see a, a good movie, that's that's a good one. Um, so in New Jersey, Fort Monmouth and Fort Hancock both had women's army corps members and also civilian women workers. Um, my aunts at the time were uh, they got their first jobs with the army, and uh, one of them retired from from the army after in the 1970s and she ended up working in a lab which she, she had a, a great wonderful career at Fort Mama. Fort Hancock was much smaller they didn't have as many women serving. So um, this is Bertha Tuting and Bertha worked in Harrison at the RCA factory and Bertha came out and did an oral history interview which you can find on our website she, the reason that we knew about her was because her husband had served at Fort Hancock and, uh, and her husband and his best friend, uh, also, they both had served for a good portion of the war at Fort Hancock. So just wanna give you a little excerpt of what she was doing. This, is, this was an ad for RCA saying, yes, I'm thankful to be working on Thanksgiving. She said she moved to Harrison in uh, 1941. She went to work for RCA and when we were doing the interview her son came with her and um, she said they asked her what she was working on and she said 
I think that's secret. But her son said, I, th I think it's okay to talk about it. Um, she worked on submarine tubes. So she was testing the, the tubes that we used to use and all the electronics, like the TVs and everything. Um, but this is pro obviously prior to that. She worked there and she married her husband at the end of the war in 1945, in April 1945. But what would happen is that at all of these plants, they would offer to bring, RCA had a bus and they came down to Fort Hancock and said, we want you, we'd like you to go to a dance. So they um, would take a bus and she came down and she, um, they were told that they couldn't go outside the building. You know, they had a chaperone come with them. She said that 20 to 25 girls came down and they had an older woman who was basically their chaperone to make sure that they were going to stay in the service club at the dance. And um, she said her future husband came in and he brought a cat and that was how he got dates because people, the ladies would like to pet the cat. So he introduced her to the cat and then they danced and then they continued to see each other and got married at the end of the war. But what's interesting with her is that after they got married and her son was born, they, they moved back to Harrison and uh, post after the war, she, she continued to work. Uh, she continued to work. She put him, she said at the time he was about four when they moved back to Harrison, she put him in the nursery. She went back to work. And instead it was all radio tubes and then she worked on TV tubes and she was a tester and she really enjoyed it. So this was her when we met her and that was her husband. Um, he had a dog in that picture. So he, he, he found the animals to take care of. So the, um, the, the wax first arrived at Fort Hancock in June of 1943. So it was created in May of 42, but it took a while. There were only, uh, there were less than a hundred at Fort Hancock. And this was the first troop that came in and they marched on in with their hemlines that were all in the same area. And they worked with, uh, at, you know, actually as secretaries, they worked as truck drivers. They worked in the dental lab. There's a whole series of photographs that were taken in World War II by the post photographer showing um, a day in a life of a whack. So this particular woman worked in the, um, the post in the dental lab. Um, they participated in sporting events. And these images are all from Fort Hancock. Um, you can see because the barracks would have if men were living in the barracks, there would have been double ducker bunks, but this particular barracks could have held more than a hundred. So they were able to have the, uh, they had wooden bunk beds. You can see the blackout curtains in the, in the pictures because uh, they had to have blackouts at night so that they protected the, uh, the ships at sea. And um, so yes, they were allowed curtains. They were allowed sheets. The men's didn't have either of that. And you can see mail day and, um, and also we have them in the mess hall. So this is also from the day in the life of the WAC, the picture that of the WAC barracks that's off limit, that was them going out with their dates for the night. There was even a WAC soldier wedding that occurred at the post chapel. This is Mary Duff Heckendorf. She was also stationed at Fort Hancock. She has an interesting story to tell because you know, I was a librarian. So she's in the picture in the post library. She's the one standing up above at the map. Um, she was a librarian for Newark, New Jersey. So when she joined the WAX, she, um, she was put immediately to work as a librarian. And she was also a contributor and editor to the Sandy Hook Foghorn. So that column left where it was sort of a tongue in cheek column, she wrote for a while that while she was there. She, um, she wanted very badly to go overseas. So her whole goal was to, to be sent overseas and she ended up being a T5, which is a technical five. And her whole interview is available on the website as well. And then Loretta Hoffman, um, we have 
in one of the links that I sent, it has her, her, she's on YouTube, uh, her, the video was actually, we actually did a video, Monmouth University came out and did an interview as we walked through the barracks that, the, that she once lived in. So um, she has a special place with me because we did a wonderful interview. And so after World War II, she got the GI Bill, which um, let her go to college and she ended up being a teacher for the next 30 years. But she married um, the soldier down there and he was the post projectionist at Fort Hancock. And in that role, he took care of all the movies. And he is one of the luckiest men that was at Fort Hancock because each post commander, there were two post commanders, but every time his unit was set to ship out, he got reassigned to another unit because the post commander did not want to not to lose his projectionist. So he ended up staying there. So they met um, because she worked in the post headquarters, but in the evening she worked at the theater and that's how they met and then they ended up marrying. And Margaret Ray McCausland and May Cicliano were civilian women who worked at Fort Hancock and their stories are also uh, available on the web through their transcriptions. Um, Margaret worked in the commissary, so getting the food supplies to the soldiers to the barracks. And May was um, recruited at Asbury Park High School to, to learn to draft. And she was an artist, so this appealed to her. And she was doing drafting skills on what later became radar equipment that was being tested first at Fort Hancock, and then they moved to Camp Evans, which is now um, on the National Register. And the, uh, the radar equipment that they were developing, she didn't know what, because it was secret, she was given certain tasks and they sent her to, to learn how to draft and then they gave her certain tasks. So she didn't know the whole system, but the radars that were developed at Fort Hancock were, uh, was the radar that detected the Japanese coming into Pearl Harbor. But because it was experimental, when the soldiers who were working the radar reported it, they said, oh, that's just a training mission. They didn't believe that. Um, so that's a little part of history there. Fort Monmouth, these women were working on, at, it was a signal core. So the signal core was uh, taking care of communications, radio and, um, and switchboards. And this is an article just saying that these two women who were sisters that both joined the WAC, one ended up being stationed at Fort Monmouth and then one at Fort Hancock. And I just love showing the latest in wax spring bonnets. So they had, uh, they showed the different type of headgear that the women were allowed to wear. Um, so this is information from Fort Monmouth talking about how the wax that were coming to Fort Monmouth, they were allowed to have up to 444. So it was much larger than what was at Fort Monmouth. And, um, not they didn't end up getting that many they got close to that we can see in july of 43 325 women reported for duty at fort mama um camp crowder was also was a major place in the signal corps so they were both at fort mama and camp crowder and what was very so the women wore an insignia with which was uh which was the Athena insignia on their uniforms. And it was real important to the higher ups that they just wear that one and not the units that they were in because they could never see a woman wearing the cross rifles of the infantry or the cross cannons of the coast artillery. But you can see that by 1944, the Women's Army Corps members in the Signal Corps, which they can say, well, that's not really combat. They were allowed to wear the Signal Corps insignia. And they were very gratified to get that because they felt out of place. They were wearing insignia that was not with everybody, the, the man sitting next to them. So they were very happy to be wearing the same insignia. So after World War II, um, it was in 1948, they made the, so at the end of World War II, by 1946, basically I had abolished all the women units, but in 1940, 
eight, they brought them back in and they became permanent regular members of the armed services. The WACs were still in their own unit, but in 1978, they abolished the WAC and they were a part of regular army units. And um, 1978, Navy women were allowed on non-combatant ships. So those big improvements. Uh, these are some pictures from the 60s at Fort Monmouth. So they were still, uh, there was still a large presence of them. If they could get a whole basketball team together, then you know that there had to be a number of them there as well. And uh, the, so, the, so one of the things I learned when I was getting some information uh, from the Fort Monmouth uh, archives, which are at Aberdeen Proving Ground, which is right where I live, um, they had a recruitment office that was in Asbury Park. So the WAC birthday, we can see uh, they were celebrating and they were still recruiting from a recruiting office in Asbury from World War II all the way through the 60s. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more, this is an article that I've written for Garden State Legacy magazine about the Women's Army Corps. So I'm gonna stop share. I have a couple of short videos that I'm gonna show. Just give me one second. I just want to make sure the sound's coming on. I have to go back in there for a second. At an Army Air Force base in Arizona, women mechanics learn to service the big bombers, receive expert instruction in every phase of aircraft maintenance. A plane named in their honor gets a thorough going over by the air wax, as they're called. From motor to tail assembly, the girls make ready the giant battleships of the air. 65,000 strong, they relieve men for combat duty. Today, the WACs are serving with the armed forces in every major theater of war. The first contingent to arrive in Australia gets a real welcome. Reporting for duty half a world away from home, these United States Army women are making a vital contribution to the cause of the United Nations. I'm just gonna show one more video. It's about the wasps. I, they, they're the ones that most fascinate me because of their dangerous mission and how they weren't, um, they weren't given any recognition at the time really. Were formed in 1943. The wasps were emerging of two earlier, relatively independent civil service programs for women pilots, led by Jackie Cochran and Nancy Love. This group of women were the first licensed female pilots in the United States to fly military airplanes for military service. The WASP flew every type of aircraft in the Army Air Force's inventory. Their duties included almost all non-combat missions, such as ferrying, towing targets for air-to-air -air gunnery practice, test flights, flight instruction, and cargo and personnel transport. When the program abruptly ended in December 1944, with the defeat of a bill to militarize the WASP, the women returned to civilian life with no veterans' benefits. It wasn't until 1979 that WAS service was considered active military service. WAS fulfilled all the expectations of those who initiated the program and helped to clear the way for women pilots of today. I'm honored to be joined here now by Elaine Harmon, Women Air Force Service Pilot. Mrs. Harmon, can you tell me a little bit about the time period and what the nation's feelings were about the war? Well, of course, when um Pearl Harbor happened, 
immediately everybody wanted to help out, do something that they could help out with the war effort. The um, government had set up a program knowing that we were very short of pilots and they had set up a civilian pilot training program to train people and get them interested. We had very, very few pilots at the beginning of the war. Mm -hmm. By the end of the war, we had something like uh, one and a half million, I think it was. Wow. <laughs> Some of whom we trained. Uh-huh. <laughs> How did you find out about the Women Air Force Service pilots, and why did you decide to join? Well, who would pass up an opportunity like that? That's why I joined. But, um, and also it was to um, help with the war effort. Mm -hmm help with the war effort and enjoy what you're doing. <laughs> right. Mrs. Harmon, what does it mean for you to pass Okay, so I just, I really uh, enjoyed uh, learning about the, the WASPs and everything that they did. But um, that's really my program. If you have any questions, I'd love to, to share. I, I really enjoy it. I, uh, as a park ranger, I uh, have uh, several uniforms of the WACs. We would do programs. I did a walking tour and do a social site of Fort Hancock. And it, I really got involved in learning about the Women's Army Corps. And I uh, have some wonderful uniforms and pieces, which if I was in person, I could be able to show you. Unfortunately, I can't. So um, please feel free to ask any questions you have.